Warren Hill has been in private practice in Mesa, Arizona for the past 29 years. I know you guys can't believe that because he looks so darn young. Um, he completed his ophthalmology training at University of Rochester and has since devoted the majority of his career to challenging anterior segment surgeries and the mathematics of intraocular lens power calculations. He's best known for helping all of the rest of us obtain accurate IOL power calculations. Dr. Hill has published extensively, serving as visiting professor for grand rounds at many institutions, has delivered 17 named lectureships, has presented more than 600 clinical papers at both national and international meetings in 34 different countries. He has performed live surgery at ophthalmology meetings on half of the world's continents. And in 2014, Dr. Hill gave the ASCRS Charles Kalman Innovators Lecture and earlier this year received the University of Rochester's Lifetime Achievement Award. Dr. Hill is going to share some pearls of wisdom in his talk, Use the LensStar LS900 to get your toric IOL right, how to best plan surgery. I'd like to welcome Dr. Hill to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> well, good afternoon. What a great pleasure it is to be here with uh, two of the people that have definitely influenced my career, uh, Thomas Olson and, and Graham Barrett, people that I look to. and think very highly of. So let's talk about the TORIC IOL. Um, how many of you here use the TORIC IOL? Well, pretty much every hand goes up. It's, it's really been one of the great advances in um, ophthalmology in the last, more than the last decade, and it's an integral part of almost all of our practices. So um, especially those of you from outside the United States, you know that anybody who makes an IOL these days is also making a TORIC IOL. So it's certainly something to, uh, to which we really have to pay attention as our, our patients are um, requesting more and more of the best um, uh, unaided uh, distance correction. So what is it that we need for the TORIC IOL? Well, there's lots of ways to get information for this. We can look at the patient's spectacle refraction, and here we have um, about a diopter of against the rule astigmatism. We can look at small zone autokeratometry. Here's a little more than three diopters uh, uh, with the rule, some simulated Ks, a little more than half a diopter, looks like this is uh, against the rule. Uh, ray tracing Ks, and here's a, well, a little more than three quarters of a diopter in the oblique meridian, and some more small zone autokeratometry, about two diopters uh, with the rule. Now, would it be surprising to you to learn that all of these measurements were from the same eye of the same patient? And this is one of the problems we have with the TORIC IOL. You know, what do we use and how do we deal with conflicting information in a way that allows us to uh, get the best possible answer? So I'm kind of reminded of the story of the six blind men who were asked by the king to describe an elephant by touching different parts of his body. And each man asserted that the elephant was something different, like a, like a rope, like a tree branch, like a hand fan, like a pipe because they were all touching different parts. And the king really explains to them, you know what, you're all right. Each one of, is, is, of you is telling it differently because you touched a different part of the elephant. And the elephant really has all the features you describe. So there are now uh, six new cornea fellows at the university, and they're asked by the department chairman to calculate the orientation and power of a toric IOL. And each asserted that the cornea is different using simulated Ks, auto Ks, shine flow Ks, slit scanning Ks, manual Ks, ray tracing Ks, perhaps taking into account the patient's zodiac sign, mother's maiden name, favorite dessert, and shoe color. And the department chairman said, you know what, every one of you is correct. The cornea has all the features you describe, but not all of these instruments are equally suited to the TORIC IOL. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how to sort of touch the cornea with our measurement techniques and come up with the right answer. So how do we know which is correct? Well, um, those of you who know me like to uh, or know that I like to steal things from other specialties, and there are lots of other organizations, professionals that deal with conflicting information and have to come up with the right answer. And one of those people, one of those groups rather, are airline pilots. You know, they make a mistake and someone's going to have a really bad day and you might end up on CNN. So how do pilots deal with conflicting information? Let's say they're flying from here to Minneapolis and one of their six important instruments goes bad. How do they know? Well, we have in aviation what we call the triangle of agreement. So let's say we're flying from here to uh, New York City, and we want to know what our course is. We use something called a heading indicator. That's like a compass, except it's a little bit more complicated. And here, when the heading indicator says it's not making a turn, you know that it's working right. But let's say, what if that 
What if that instrument froze and just stood there and didn't, didn't make any changes? Well, we have backup instrumentation. So the heading indicator would be primary for what we're looking to do. And two other instruments called an attitude indicator and a turn and bank indicator are secondary. They all give us the similar information. One is primary and one is secondary. And if they all agree and they all work by different methods, we know that we're probably on a solid footing. A primary instrument is one that always gives us the correct information when it's presented a certain way, and we can use that for the TORIC well. A supporting uh, instrument is one that helps us to understand that that's correct. So here we have our three instruments. Our heading indicator says we're going this way. Turn and bank indicator tells us we're not making a turn. Attitude indicator tells us we're not making a turn either. So if our attitude indicator suddenly says we're in a descending right turn and all the other things are correct, we know that that instrument is probably the one to not be correct. So again, we're not just using multiple instruments, we're using multiple instruments in certain ways with primary and secondary roles. So let's take this way of thinking and you know, move it over to what we do for the TORIC IOL. Now, the TORIC calculator, you know, there's a lot of things we put into it, but the two main things the TORIC calculators are looking for is what is the orientation of the steep and the flat meridians, and we need to know the power difference between meridians set a different way, that's our corneal astigmatism. So here's, here's our primary instrument. This is our heading indicator for the toric eye. Well, it's just the humble axial map for um, the cornea. And here we're going to look at the Zeiss Atlas topographer, which is one of the, the uh, standard instruments for this kind of an in, uh, industry standard. And if you look at the central 3.5 millimeters, draw a line through the corneal vertex and the center of each of the two astigmatic lobes, where it intersects the axis scale and the periphery, can only be the steep meridian. Again, a primary instrument is one that always gives us the correct information when presented a certain way. Now, if we look at our keratometry, we look and see, is the keratometer measuring in the correct place? We look and see if the keratometer says that our steep meridian is the same as what we already know to be correct. So keratometry is primary for the power difference between if it's measuring in the right location and secondary to confirm the steep meridian. So these are just the two things you need. You need a topographer and you need a good source of keratometry. So let's look at another axial map. This is the T-cone from the, the Lenstar. Believe it or not, the Lenstar actually has a device that sits on the front that gives us an axial topographic map. Looks very much like the Zeiss Atlas 9000 topographer. So there's our three millimeter zone for this. There's our steep meridian. There's our flat meridian. And just to repeat, this is primary for the steep meridian, secondary for the power difference. There's our Ks. We make sure that the two line up properly. And now we know what the orientation is of the steep meridian and what the power difference is between. So this is what the T-cone looks like. It goes on right on the front of the, of the Lenstar. We like to joke that this turns the Lenstar into a Swiss Army knife, basically. It doesn't have a toothpick and a spoon, but it has just about everything else. And it looks just like the, the Zeiss Atlas topographer. It has the same sort of Placido rings. And the measurement area is about 6 millimeters instead of 9 millimeters. And it was validated against the Atlas 9000 topographer and came out almost exactly the same, both for normal eyes, spherical eyes, and astigmatic eyes, and also valid against the Lenstar Ks, which are, in my opinion, are the, are the best Ks in the business. So this can be used with confidence um, in, in place of the, just the regular Ks on the, on the Lenstar, and it also gives us an axial topographic map. This is what it looks like. You can see it's not very intrusive. It sits right in front of the, the patient's eye. With a single button push, you get the topographic map, your Ks, and also all the axial measurements. Now you only get you not only get that, but you get several other types of topographic maps. And if we just look at the axial map right here, you click on that and there's what it looks like expanded. And then here's what we can use for determining the steep and flat meridians and then the, the keratometry values for the power difference between. So this is pretty much all in one, pretty everything you need for that part of the toric eye well. Now also on the lens star is a wonderful little um, a line that can, you can move to the left and right, and you can superimpose the topographic map on the image of the eye, line everything up, and read the steep meridian with this all-in-one uh, device. So let's talk about different types of keratometers and, and why this is slightly different. Here's, um, here's the, the original Iowa Master strategy for keratometry. We have three measurements above, three measurements below the horizontal, and it's a 2.5 millimeter zone. 
This instrument was originally designed for the spherical power of the lens. It was not designed for torics, and that's why we sometimes get surprises. If you look at the center measurement here, we, this device measures at, at uh, 60, 120, and 180. So at 90 and, at, and between the 120 and 180 measurement, the instrument has to do some extrapolation. So that's why it has some blind spots and why we can sometimes get a surprise. This is how keratometry works. Basically, we look at almost like a double, double sine wave. We have our, where it has the greatest power. We look at where that meridian occurs. And basically, that's our steep and our flat meridians. But you can see a fair amount of iteration has to take place um, between points in order to come up with something. And those of us who've used the IO Master know that between 60 and 120 is 90. And that instrument always seems to have the most trouble at 90 because that's where it's doing most of its iteration. This is the, uh, the Lensstar. It has two zones, 2.3 and 1.65 millimeters. There's the, the outer zone. Here's the inner zone right here, inner ring rather. And if we look at the first measurement, we can see that the distance between measurement points is not very great. So there's very little iteration that has to take place. So this is what's referred to as high density autokeratometry. And if we look at this instrument compared to the one before, you can see that there's one ring. Here's our second ring. Here's our steep and our flat meridians. You can see very little iteration takes place. So this higher density form of keratometry is better suited to detecting both the steep and the flat meridian and also the power difference. Anybody read Russian? There you go. There's one person. Okay. Trust but verify. Okay. So just a couple other quick things about it. And I know Dr. Barrett's going to talk about you know, his uh, toric method. The, the um, iSuite Torque IOL planner, which is a kind of a at separate a piece of software that you can add on, uh, gives you the Barrett formula, the Barrett calculator, which adds the posterior cornea, which allows that calculator to use a third vector for the calculation of the orientation of the steep meridian. And um, it's, this is what I use in, in my own practice, and it works very, very nicely. It's becoming a standard. Um, for the Barrett cor Torah calculator, we use a surgically induced astigmatism value that's a centroid value, which is 0 0.12, which is what we're using. Also, you can go online. There's a, there's a tool for calculating surgically induced astigmatism that will give a median, a mean, and also a centroid value, and that's at siacalculator.com. So you can actually come up with this value yourself. I've stopped marking the cornea. Instead, I use the image off of the lens star. And um, if you click in this one little area in the upper right-hand corner that's, that's highlighted, uh, here I've marked uh, four different uh, landmarks that won't go away with dilation. And I take this, hang it upside down on the microscope, and now I know exactly where these four points are. And it does a lot better job for us as far as determining references and where to put the toric eye well. Um, I also like to have uh, Dr. Olson's formula and Dr. Barrett's formula both displayed for my favorite intraocular lens, and I look at them uh, at the same time when I'm making decisions regarding intraocular lens power. And just a couple quick comments about the instrument. All of the measurements are done by optical bi biometry, so central corneal thickness, aqueous depth, anterior chamber depth, lens thickness, and then the axial length are all by opt uh, optical biometry. The current version of the LensStar just uses a slit image estimation for the anterior chamber depth. And not only does it give it a lens thickness, but you can actually see all the component parts of the lens. Now, there's the anterior capsule, the cortex nucleus interface, different parts of the nucleus, and the posterior capsule. How thick is the posterior capsule? It's about five to seven microns. That's the thickness of a red blood cell. And here we have a signal with the LensStar. So the accuracy here is really you know, quite remarkable compared to what the Owlmaster does, which is just a global measurement from the corneal vertex to the pigment epithelium. And then one last thing I'll leave you with is validation criteria. Remember, a measurement's only as good as our ability to know what it means. And if something comes up that may not be quite right, we need to be able to, to pick it up. And um, this is downloadable from the Hogstride website. This is the validation criteria, say, for keratometry. We look at the standard deviation and make sure that it's within these ranges. And each part of the measurement process from Hogstride has validation criteria that we and our staff can use to make sure that things are right. And if something isn't quite right, then we go back and we remeasure. As the carpenters say, we measure twice and we cut once. So in summary, uh, this is you know, high resolution measurements of the central corneal thickness, anterior chamber depth, lens thickness, and um, axial length. We now have the T-cone, which is um, a topographic device for a biometer. That's a first. And the topographic map 
um, validates the orientation of the steep meridian, also tells us do we have regular symmetrical astigmatism. The steep meridian validates the power difference uh, between the, the two principal uh, meridians of the cornea. This is a highly accurate method that allows us to do the toric eye well with a lot of predictability. It also has the most sophisticated formulas, Dr. Olson's formula and Dr. Barrett's formula, which we rely on now exclusively in our practice. And it has an integrated Barrett toric calculator that Dr. Barrett will talk about in a few minutes. And multiple uh, landmark site identification for toric eye well placement. Really, this truly is a Swiss Army knife. It's just an amazing instrument for biometry. Thank you. Warren, thank you so much. Every time you talk, I'm furiously writing down notes and trying to keep them all mentally packed into my head because there's always so many great pearls of, of wisdom to share. A couple of, of questions. First, what if somebody out there doesn't have a topographer? All they've got at their office is one unit, a keratometer. Is it reasonable to perform uh, toric corrections with toric implant lenses or other astigmatic corrections in that setting? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, actually, you need a topographer. It's just something you have to have. And it gives you three pieces of information. One is the astigmatism regular. Is it symmetrical? And what's the orientation of the steep meridian? So you really do have to have a topographer, Mike. Um, can you explain to us a little bit more about the centroid? What is a centroid? What does that mean? Yeah, well, centroid is, is just one of the ways we look at our, at our outcomes. You can take a mean, which is an average, a median, which is... In, in essence, a median just gets rid of some of the outliers. And a centroid is the, the kind of the mass center of, of your data plotted in two dimensions. If you have an error, what happens is the centroid shifts to the right, to the left, to the up or down, and you get some insight as to perhaps what the origin of this error might be. When your collection of data in, in two dimensions, and like a double angle plot where it's uh, axis and then power, if all of your data clusters in the middle, then you know pretty much you're, you're not dealing with some bias in the calculation. The barrett toric calculator works best with a centroid value, and that surgically induced astigmatism calculator will provide a centroid for your database. And uh, with the T-cone attachment, we can obtain both the keratometry and the simulated keratometry from the topographic measurements. Do you find the T-cone as accurate as uh, what you've described as the gold standard in the industry for the keratometry uh, taken without the T-cone on the lens star. Yeah, that was part of that study that I presented. And, and basically, it's better than a quarter diopter accuracy uh, for, of the keratometry of the lens star. So it's really spectacular. And that's absolutely just awesome stuff.